the highest award that Western University of Health Sciences bestows is the Ellie Wiesel Award. And it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Astrid Heppenstall Hager as the recipient of this year's Ellie Wiesel Humanism in Healing Award. The award is designed to recognize those who commit themselves to working on behalf of and protecting the most vulnerable among us. Dr. Hager has a lifetime of achievement focused on others. In 1984, she founded the Center for the Vulnerable Child to evaluate child abuse, the first clinically-based child advocacy center in the world. Today, the center evaluates more than 15,000 child abuse and child sexual assault victims every year. In 1995, Dr. Hager established the Family Advocacy Center, the first to op offer comprehensive support services to victims of family violence and sexual assault throughout Los Angeles County. She also established an adult protection team and an elder abuse forensic center to provide direct services to high-risk elders and dependent adults, as well as to assist professionals charged with protecting this most vulnerable population. Most recently, she implemented a model program for services for children at risk for or already in foster care, incorporating a 24-7 forensic and medical assessments along with ongoing medical home with built-in mental health services, as well as support services that include dental care, plastic surgery, mentoring, and tutoring. This Children's Welcome Center and the Companion Youth Welcome Center have changed the landscape of how children enter foster care and have greatly improved both placement rates and permanency of placements. Dr. Hager is the Executive Director of the Violence Intervention Program at Los Angeles County Hospital, University of Southern California Medical Center, and a professor of clinical pediatrics at USC's Keck School of Medicine. The recipient of numerous honors and awards for her work with victims of abuse, including the President's highest award for victim advocacy, she has been featured in national print media, as well as on all of the major television networks and CNN, and has served as a commentator on family and juvenile violence. At this time, I would ask Linda Kranz, Vice Chair of the University's Board of Trustees, and Dr. Stephen Friedrichsen, the Dean of the College of Dental Medicine, to join me for the presentation. What makes a child not only survive, but thrive? 30 years ago in East Los Angeles, the Violence Intervention Program began as a small child abuse clinic with two part-time staff at the county hospital. Today, the Violence Intervention Program serves as the primary hub for all child abuse cases in Los Angeles County, with programs across two campuses treating victims of violence of all ages. I think the interesting thing is watching how our volume has grown. You know, there's about 24, 25,000 individuals that wander through our program just on the medical side, to say nothing of the five or 600 kids who get ongoing treatment here within the mental health side. The Violence Intervention Program is a pioneer in transforming the treatment and care for all victims of violence. Through our Children's Medical Village, the S. Mark Taper Family Advocacy Center, our Children's and Youth Welcome Centers, Sexual Assault Center, Elder Abuse Forensic Center, and our upcoming Teen Center, we place the long-term success of our clients as our highest priority. In addition to providing comprehensive medical and mental health care for our victims and their families, the Violence Intervention Program model succeeds because we go beyond traditional care by asking our clients one simple question. How can we help you? Here, uh, the details mean that the kids that come in uh, get to take away something. It's, it's the personal invent, uh, investment in the family, the idea that I'll come in your household, or you come to see me in my clinic and I ask you, what can I do to help you? Right, hey, write down on the list here, what do you need? And I, and I listen to you, pay attention, I fix it. To support this movement, a committed group of donors and advocates founded HEART, a membership organization that raises funds to meet the unique needs of our clients 
by paying attention to the details that matter most. It can be a tiny need to something bigger. Does anybody have a, an extra TV or anybody have a refrigerator? Do you know of anybody? With the help of Heart, our community partners, and our dedicated staff, the family of services within the Violence Intervention Program continue to make an impact and give a voice to those who are most vulnerable. You want to operate on that premise every day, that you can change lives. And I think that's the thing about VIP, is that everybody that works here knows, knows that they can change a life. Now, please join us in welcoming a powerful advocate for the rights of children and families impacted by violence, Dr. Astrid Hager. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Fox and Dr. Pomerantz. I'm really pleased to be here. What an amazing audience, an amazing setting, and I'm just stunned and, and great grateful to all of you. Um, of course, I would have shown up anyway if somebody told me I could put in my office or hang on my wall something that had Elie Wiesel's name on it, I would be ecstatic because what an amazing uh, human being he was. And I want to thank my staff, my friends, my board, that drove all the way out here to, uh, to Orange County from LA. I really appreciate that. I want to especially thank Zach for uh, orchestrating all of this, for doing such an amazing job on the video. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I mean, that was uh, not easy. I understand that. Um, I want to thank Judy Miller from Hilton for nominating me. What, a, what an honor it is to have you as a friend. And I want to say something to Bob Tranquata, who was a dean at the med school when I was asked to come back and resuscitate the child abuse program. He was also one of my professors when I was in med school there. And I, if I can live up to his standard, I would, be, uh, I would feel like my life was a success. So thank you so much for, for coming and, and joining us. Uh, so I, um, the other reason that I came is I really absolutely love students. Um, and I love teaching students, and I have a lot of students that I hang out with that are from this university. So I wanted to, uh, to talk to you a little bit. But because this is a very festive uh, event, and, I can, and there are very few really super lighthearted moments in my career when you deal with violence and sexual assault and death and murders and all that, there's a little hard time to find some levity. But uh, there are occasionally those moments in my career where you actually laugh out loud. And I was in uh, Dallas, uh, going to give a lecture in Dallas some years ago, and I was sidetracked into Fort Worth because I had a friend that was practicing there. And she says, Astrid, you know, while you're here, we have these kids from West Texas, and uh, we, need, we, have a, we need, help, need your help. I want you to take a look at them. We think they were all sexually abused. We don't know. So we're standing in the hallway in, in Fort Worth, Texas, and down the hall comes this group of, of uh, social workers and DAs and cops bringing these little kids in. And you can always immediately tell the DAs, right, because they had the gabardine suits on, the bell-bottom trousers, the boots, the big belts, the big buckles, the three Bs. And the cops are in polyester, same outfit, but polyester. And then these little kids coming down. So I'm, so I'm in this room with this little seven-year-old. His name was Kevin. And I said, so um, as I usually do, I say, so Kevin, um, who do you want in the room with you as a support person? And he says, I want Charlie. So I stick my nose out the door and I said, is there a Charlie out here? And it was one of the cops. So he comes in, sits down on the table. I, I make these guys love it. I sit up on that OBGYN table. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so Kevin climbs up between his legs and he looks around at Charlie and he says, uh, hey Charlie, do you have your gun? And he says, yeah, you know, he reaches into his boot. Like, who knew, right? Pulls out his gun and he says, uh, so Charlie, you see that lady there? If she hurts me, shoot her. 
Lots of tension. Lots of pressure. Just real careful. I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, uh, quickly, because I'm the one thing that stands between you and the dance floor, and I'm personally aware of that. But I wouldn't have come if I couldn't talk to you a little bit about what possesses me to do what I do and what I want to possess you, students, to do what you're going to do. My father was a Seventh-day Adventist minister. His name was Edward Heppenstall, and he taught me something very early on in life, something about cheap grace. It's what Elie Wiesel went on to call moral indifference. And that is where we see things that needs to be changed, that must be changed, that should be changed, and we remain silent. It is the image of that little boy in Romania being put on a truck to be sent to the death camps and looking up into the windows in the central square of his village and realizing that his classmates and their parents were standing and sitting in the windows watching him go off to his certain death and said nothing. It's the idea that, that silence is absolutely deadly, and when you and we all need to say and do the things that nobody else will do. VIP chose to do things and push the hard button. It's not easy to have built this program and to do this. We were at, asked, actually asked to do the hard things, and we and actually VIP has never ever said no. And we our goal has been to change the outcome for the patients that we see, be they, be they very young or very old. And it grew like this. I'm a pediatrician. It grew with three little Leon girls who came in who were being molested by their mother's boyfriend. And I realized after I saw them the second time that I had missed them and I had focused on the science and I'd forgotten about the patients. And I changed and I learned to do things differently. It was a seven-year-old little rape victim off the streets of LA who came in wearing a dress five sizes too big with no underwear, filthy, dirty, dirt grind into her which made me know that I had to have heart. I had to have this group of women who would give me underwear and clothes, and that I needed to have a place to bathe the kids, and I needed something more than just making a diagnosis and putting the bad guys in jail. It was a 19-year-old rape victim from the University of Washington who the police brought in and said, hey, please see her. We're not going to take her to an ER. I want you to do the exam so that it was done quickly and humanely. That started the rape center. It was a 22-year-old with blind newborns, twins, who said, my husband tried to kill me when I was pregnant, and now he wants to kill us because the kids are blind. That started the domestic violence program. I'm sitting there getting my chest x-ray to get my badge for the hospital when an 82-year-old woman sitting next to me with two broken arms and her head bashed in, and I took her to the bathroom, and when I was pulling up her underwear, I asked her, what's wrong with you? What happened? And she said, my son-in-law threw me down the stairs, which started the elder abuse program. It was a mental health, it was like I couldn't get anybody in the county to give them counseling. So we incorporated and started a mental health piece. Uh, it was a death of a little boy by the name of Lance Helms, and, and at that was sent back to his father over and over and over again until he was killed. That started the, our, our foster home program for kids, a medical home for them. And it was, uh, it was social workers. One night, middle of the night, I'm there. They brought in this little two and a half year old whose mother dragged him across the asphalt at uh, Santa Monica Beach and dumped him on the sand and abandoned him. And they brought him in to the clinic and they said, Astrid, can't I leave him here? I don't want to take him back downtown where there are no beds and no food and no bath and nothing. And that's how the Children's Welcome Center was born, which now transformed these kids. These little kids are coming, they get a bath, they have clothes, they have food, amazing. And the Companion Youth Welcome Center, which has now precipitated us into building the Teen Center. Heart this group of women from all over LA that buy everything from plastic surgery to clothes to fixing cars to anything you can think of, we say yes to. Moving women into safe housing, that's the real answer. It's changing the outcome. So we don't practice cheap grace. 
Chief grace is where you know you can make a difference, that's all of us, and we choose not to. We push the easy button, we don't want to do that. We want to push the hard button. There's one final story, I'm sorry I'm taking this long. But my son is here tonight and I wanted to come back to my dad. My dad was this amazing man who was a child laborer in the steel mills of England who came to the US and became a brilliant professor, an amazing man. And I grew up with this example of never practicing cheap grace, never practicing moral indifference. And here we are approaching the holidays, so I'm gonna end on this note. When I, one of my first memories was at, at holiday time, at Christmas time, he would say, we will find the poorest family. Now I'm telling you, we were poor. We will find the poorest family in Riverside County and we will give them Christmas. We will give it to the parents, so we give twice. We give it to the parents, the parents give it to the children. This is how VIP operates now at the holiday time. So I can remember going down this long dirt road in my dad's 46 Ford, black with that square back, with the tree, with the food, with the presents, with the wrapping paper, and my brother and I sat in the back seat, and my dad walked up to this ramshackle house, the porch falling off the front of the house, and left everything on the front porch, and came back, knocked on the door, came back and got in the car, and I can remember with my little face pressed against that flat back window, watching that father come out and collect everything off the porch. And my dad reminding me, and he re, as he reminded me again when I graduated from med school, don't ever live your life to be insignificant. Live it to be memorable. Live it to be remarkable. And as Ili Wazel said, sometimes words in moments of grace attain the quality of deeds. So I am challenging you as VIP has assumed our responsibility to do the deeds, say the words that no one else will say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that.